Well, good evening. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome you tonight on behalf of the Harvard Kennedy School and the Institute of Politics. I'm Graham Allison, the director of the Belfer Center. In your program, you'll see we have an extraordinary panel tonight to discuss one of the central issues uh, that the country is struggling with, uh, namely Afghanistan or AFPAC and the president's decision uh, just announced on Tuesday night to significantly increase America's co commitment uh, to the war on the ground in Afghanistan. So uh, to my left is Megan O'Sullivan. Uh, she's a professor of practice here until she came to the Kennedy School. She was the Deputy National Security Advisor to President Bush and was uh, the, one of the chief cooks in the kitchen that created the surge in Iraq that uh, ended up with General Petraeus and others changing facts on the ground uh, there. Sitting beside her is Rory Stewart. Rory is the director of the Carr Center uh, and has been involved in Afghanistan for now a dozen years, including uh, running a foundation that has about 450 people working there on the ground tonight in Afghanistan trying to improve people's lives. He's thought about this issue for some time. Brad McKirk is next to Brad, it's the, Brett, excuse me, uh, is a, a fellow at the Institute of Politics this year. Uh, he was also at the National Security Council just before this present uh, assignment, and he and Megan were colleagues there. Uh, he was in charge, actually, of the efforts that uh, Megan and others assisted in, but that produced the agreement in Iraq, the so-called SOFA agreement, for the status of US forces who are remaining in Iraq as we move towards the transition to their exit from Iraq. And finally, uh, Ted Olstrom uh, is uh, uh, our director of the National Security Fellows Program. Uh, Ted is a retired three-star Air Force general uh, who served uh, in many different uh, theaters and who's been here for the last several years helping particularly with our group of lieutenant colonels and colonels who come as national security fellows uh, 
provide for their year that's a roughly equivalent of the National War College, but he's also been actively involved in thinking about these issues. So we couldn't have a better panel. Uh, the topic couldn't be more timely. Uh, and what the, the proposed program will do tonight is we'll start off by having some discussion among ourselves. And then at some point, we'll turn to the audience as well. And there'll be opportunities for you to put questions. So um, I think as most of you are aware, General McChrystal, who was the chosen general uh, uh, by uh, President Obama and by General Petraeus, who's the CENTCOM commander, uh, produced a report that uh, came to President Obama in the middle of September, which was immediately leaked and which all of us who follow this topic read with great care, which said that on the current course we were going to lose in Afghanistan that the momentum was decidedly against us, and that uh, he needed at least 40,000 troops urgently to try to reverse the momentum. President Obama uh, then engaged in what I think is a historian of uh, presidential policymaking, an unprecedented uh, uh, and extensive deliberation about these proposals in which over the past nine weeks, there have been nine or 10 seminars, usually three hours a clip, with all of the chief policymakers, no holds barred, all options debated, all assumptions examined and re-examined, leading up to a speech that the president gave on Tuesday night, making his announcement. So let's go to the first clip, which is President Obama on Tuesday night uh, telling us the This conclusion. review is now complete. And as Commander-in-Chief, I have determined that it is in our vital national interest to send an additional 30,000 U.S. troops to Afghanistan. After 18 months, our troops will begin to come home. These are the resources that we need to seize the initiative while building the Afghan capacity that can allow for a responsible transition of our forces out of Afghanistan. So the first question to the panel, and I would just ask you to answer uh, support or oppose, and in less than a minute, why? Why don't we start with, uh, with Megan? Very, very rigid. Um, I would say that I support with some considerable reservations. I think endorsing a counterinsurgency strategy and sending 30,000 troops is a very bold move by the president, but I'm worried about his ability to convince America that this is a vital interest, but one in which we only have limited time and limited resources to devote to it. And I'm concerned about the mention of a timeline, even as subtle a timeline as he included, as being uh, very detrimental to the overall effort. But support. Support with considerable okay. reservations. Rory, support or oppose? Uh, I, I'm against with considerable reservations. <laughs> Good. Good. Um, there is so much good which is going on in that speech, particularly the second half of the speech is very exciting. He opens up the possibility of a much more moderate long-term engagement. Unfortunately, he makes this Faustian pact, which you've just seen on the screen, which is he trades force for time. And this is always the problem with the surge. The problem with the surge isn't so much that it's not going to work, though it probably won't. It's not so much that it's disproportionate to American interests in the region, though that too may be true. The problem with the surge is that it accelerates the pace of withdrawal. So as soon as McChrystal had written that report, he was on these rails heading towards withdrawal because he couldn't stand up in front of those people that she saw in the crowd, couldn't stand up in front of the West Point graduates, promise 30,000 more troops without promising an exit, particularly to certain elements of the Democratic Party. So, I think the tragedy is that Afghanistan is all about time. It's all about patience. It's all about a moderate, long-term engagement, particularly to retain leverage over the Taliban. And by going for the surge, he's gone for the withdrawal. And sadly, I don't know how he's going to get out of this. OK, Brett. I, I support with very few reservations. Um, conceptually, conceptually, it's not a surge. It's a bridge. It's a bridge to get to that moderate, long-term engagement that Rory is talking about. And what McChrystal is saying is that you you can't get from here to there unless over the next 12 months we reestablish the initiative, we fill this deficiency of capacity among the Afghan 
security forces and government and begin to do that, and then set the conditions that we begin to draw down and get to that moderate long-term engagement, which is exact, exactly where we want to get to. So if you look at it as a bridge strategy, which I think it is, um, I think it's a very sound approach. It's, it's uh, the president, as he said, was set with a, faced with a set of very imperfect options, and um, I think here he chose the best one, but a very, very difficult one. Ted? I agree, I support, but with reservations like the others as well. First off, I think there was a consensus with all these meetings that occurred that the McChrystal report had some real meat in it, and there was a real consensus that something needed to be done. So I certainly support, number one, the report, and support that something is being done in the way of a surge, whether that's the right words or not. The reservation, and somewhat disappointing, is the fact that I think the president was trapped for lots of political reasons into announcing some type of an arbitrary date. And, and we just had to recognize that in the speech that that was part of it. I think there's lots of loopholes to, if you would, moderate how this withdrawal will occur down the road. Okay. H helpful. Just uh, for your information, just before we came, uh, Kathy McLaughlin gave me a copy of a poll that the Harvard Institute of Politics just conducted of young people, uh, 18 to 29-year-olds, across the country, in which finding that 58% of, this is 2,900 people, so pretty broad sample, 58% of this age group approve of President Obama's job performance in general, but two-thirds of this group oppose sending additional troops to Afghanistan. So that's quite an interesting uh, commentary. Let me see if we can go to the Senator McCain uh, clip uh, in his comments on the President's announcement, please. That should be clip two. And in this case, do you think that the Republicans will support the President? Yes, I do, uh, and I hope the Democrats will too. This is a properly resourced counterinsurgency strategy, but I worry a great deal and don't support a date for withdrawal. You can't have a counterinsurgency strategy which is based on success and at the same time set an arbitrary date for withdrawal. They don't match up. Well, so what about that? So David, David Ignatius in his column yesterday in the Post strongly supported the President's decision, but with reservations. And as he says in the, his reservation, the idea that we strengthen our hand by announcing in advance that we plan to fold it, seems hard for him to understand. So what about that? Whoever. I'm happy to start, but not okay. to railroad you into the same. No, 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 please. Um, the thing that I was looking for most out of this speech and this announcement, and really the overall policy review, was a demonstration of a long-term commitment to the region. The most important thing here, if we really try to boil it down to one issue, is the need to convince Pakistan that America is going to be a long-term partner and that it can take on the Taliban with the confidence in knowing that America will be there in some capacity. It doesn't have to be a military, huge military presence, but it will be a partner for a new kind of security arrangement in the region. The timeline really says we're going to be with you, but for a limited period of time. Um, just so everyone is clear, I know most of you have read the speech and listened to it, but the timeline is really one just for the beginning of the removal of forces. And so in that sense, I think that he, oh, President Obama was trying to meet his domestic constituents' needs and send the right message to the region. The problem is this is just too clever by half. If this, I believe, is just a case where you can't have your cake and eat it too, that the message to those people in the Pakistan army who are trying to go after the Afghan Taliban is really, um, you're going to be undermined. Um, that why should you go after this group of people when they could well be in power in a few years' time from now after America leaves? Well, that's really, Rory, so you're back out in, uh, in Afghanistan and one of your friends says, what did he say? Well, one of the striking things, I mean, I, the, less I'm back out in Afghanistan, one of the striking things is last night I was watching, um, sorry, the night before, watching it upstairs there with three Afghan friends. And what was very striking is that their reaction was not 
this is a drawdown. Did you notice that he said we're going to begin? In other words, none of the lawyerly language was operating. The takeaway that seemed to be coming from it is they're leaving in 18 months' time. And the question is the optics of this. It, it's not whether Obama is able or, or whether even Brett is able to reframe it as a drawdown to a moderate strategy, but whether predominantly the Taliban perceive it as that. And my sense is the Taliban perceive it as an exit. And therefore, we've given away the fundamental leverage required in order to bring the Taliban from the negotiating table. I think uh, I, I agree with both of those comments. And I think the administration is now a little bit uh, torqued up in trying to describe this, because Gates had a really hard time the past couple of days, today and yesterday, saying, look, it's not a hard timeline. We're going to look in December of 2010 to see whether we can still meet this goal of July of 2011. And then even then, it's only when we begin to bring down our surge forces. And he said today something very interesting. Even if we meet that goal, the surge forces, a full 30,000 uh, contingent of force, which is a lot of combat power, will be in place for 14 months, even if we meet that goal. That's a long time. We had the surge forces in Iraq fully in place for only about six months. Um, so this is a massive, massive military commitment. The policy, as I understand it, and I think Secretary Gates confirmed this, is that all we're talking about is when those surge forces will begin to draw down. But I fully agree with Rory. The optics of this are very bad. And what's coming out of Pakistan is very unfortunate, because Obama said the strategy has three components, a military component in Afghanistan, a civilian component, and Pakistan, a strategic partnership with Pakistan. Those are the three legs of the stool in the speech. And yet what is coming out now from the Pakistanis is they're seeing a lack of commitment, uh, a replay of what happened in 1990. And that's very unfortunate. And the administration is going to have to have to correct the misperception. Ken, do you disagree? Uh, or you uh, well, I, I agree, basically, that the 18-month uh, arbitrary date that was put in there was a very uncomfortable part of the speech. Uh, but looking at that, uh, Secretary Gates had an interesting comment in one of his interviews where people were essentially saying that, well, geez, the Taliban and the Al-Qaeda are just going to shut down for the next 18 months and wait. His re retort to that was, I'd take that any day, because what we need is time without the pressures of the Taliban and Al-Qaeda to do the build and build the security. And we will be that much further along in terms of achieving some of the stability that we need to turn the Afghan people in the right direction. So there might be another part of that that might be a, a benefit if you were to take a look at that 18-month piece in another way. OK. Well, uh, pushing a little further to the strategy that is chosen as it relates to the objectives that are stated, the pre president has been uh, careful over and over to say, I have uh, limited, precise, clear objectives. And then he has the same line that he uses over and over. And he's proposed uh, as the strategy for achieving those objectives of what he announced. And my question is, what's the connection between the objectives and the strategy? Or is the strategy chosen, as he describes it, the best strategy for achieving the objectives? But let's let uh, let's take the third clip and let Obama say say it in his, his own terms. Our overarching goal remains the same: to disrupt, dismantle, and defeat Al Qaeda in Afghanistan and Pakistan, and to prevent its capacity to threaten America and our allies in the future. To meet that goal, we will pursue the following objectives within Afghanistan: we must deny Al Qaeda a safe haven. We must reverse the Taliban's momentum and deny it the ability to overthrow the government. And we must strengthen the capacity of Afghanistan's security forces and government so that they can take lead responsibility for Afghanistan's future. OK, so let me do it again, and you can take it in any order you want. So if, if the objective is to disrupt, dismantle, and defeat the Taliban, Sorry, Al-Qaeda, excuse me, do it again. Apologies, thank you. The objective is to disrupt, dismantle, and defeat Al-Qaeda. Is the strategy chosen 
the best way to accomplish that objective? And the answer is yes or no. And then, of course, it's more complicated than that, so views. And again, you're free and there's no particular order. We don't have to go like lockstep, please. Yeah. I mean, just, just, just to step up, I'd say, um, yes, it is, it is a good way of dealing with Al-Qaeda, but I think one of the most exciting things about that little clip that we just watched is how much the president's language has shifted since March. In March, he was saying, there is an uncompromising core of the Taliban. They must be met with force, and they must be defeated. He's now saying that he wants to deny the Taliban the ability to overtake the country. That's a much more limited demand. In March, he was saying that he wanted to promote a more capable and accountable Afghan government, advance security, opportunity, and justice. Now he's explicitly saying, not in this clip, but a bit later on, that he's not in the business of nation building. So his whole definition of victory has diminished enormously in nine months. And actually, with, with respect to the panel, he's very, very careful to avoid the word counterinsurgency right the way through this speech. If you look at the March-April speech, he refers four times to insurgency. And in the white paper, it refers explicitly to counterinsurgency. Now, he refers only twice to insurgency, once where he says this is not a broad-based popular insurgency. So I think what we're seeing is actually somebody moving towards something much more like a counter-terrorist strategy away from a counter-insurgency strategy. Well, let's stay on that piece of it, and then we'll go to the strategy piece. Because a number of people have commented that if you read the speech, and I, I have missed it, you certainly don't find any, the word victory does not appear in the speech. Actually, the word success does not appear in this speech. So uh, there's been a lot of commentary about basically defining our objectives down to something more modest. So before we go to the strategy, what about Rory's proposition that we're defining our goals down? If I may comment on that. Please. I agree that this speech has a more narrow set of goals, but I don't see that it has a more narrow strategy. And so I think he has would it ha a strategy which does have logic related to the goals, but one that is inherently difficult for Americans and others to understand. If we have a narrower strategy, why is our effort so expansive? And perhaps no one's using the word nation building, but we're talking about building Afghan national security forces. We're talking about strengthening the Afghan government. This is nation building. Um, it, people might call it building state capacity. There's all different ways we can refer to it. I don't have any particular attachment to any uh, nomenclature. But at the end of the day, I think the administration, and to be fair, foreign policy analysts all around the world are trying to figure out how do you deny a group like Al-Qaeda the ability to operate without actually building up something to operate in that space in place of it. Going to your larger question, I. Um, I think the logic is there, and I think the strategy is correct. I'm concerned that he could have been a little bit more explicit in talking about the role of Pakistan in that overall strategy. That really a big part of denying Al-Qaeda that capability has to do with ensuring that Pakistan is not destabilized by an Afghanistan that falls to the Taliban. So that's a, a sequence of events that he may have uh, laid out a little bit clearer to make people understand the relationship between the Taliban regaining control in Afghanistan and what that would mean for Pakistan and what that would therefore mean for American interests. Okay, but let, let me not give up on the, and let me see if sure. there are other comments. Because there are two, two components of this. One is, what are my objectives? And either the objectives have been shrunk further, that's Rory's hypothesis, or they're about the same. There's a second question is, for whatever those objectives are, do I have a strategy that's appropriately matched? Mm -hmm. One of the things that Professor Rose Sullivan teaches in the course that I taught with her is that mismatches between goals and objectives is one of the ways that we freq frequently fail. Objectives and means. But yeah. the, 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 the match or mismatch, so if the objectives have been defined down a little, if Rory's right, and if the means have increased significantly, then the likelihood of a match is improved. Yeah? And so what about the, the defining of the objectives uh, more precisely or in, a, or in a more limited fashion? Does that sound right or not? I don't have a problem with the fact that he downscoped a little bit the objectives. 
until I started to think about another comment he had in the speech that says there are other places in this world where we're going to have to consider extremists, violent extremists. And if we keep downscoping the objectives in Afghanistan where we're at, how are we going to treat and the problems that may come up in Yemen or Somalia or other places? I think it really impacts uh, how we treat these folks in the rest of the world. I just, from, from the cliff, the three objectives, they're, they're a little narrower, but I mean, this is a, a, a massive task. Degrade, dismantle, defeat al-Qaeda. Interesting, reverse the momentum of the Taliban. I think that reflects this debate they had internally in the Situation Room. Do we really need to take on the Taliban? Can we live with the Taliban controlling large swaths of Afghanistan? Are they really that linked to, to, to al-Qaeda? I think the, the answer that came back probably from the intelligence analyses and was that you can't. You need to degrade the Taliban's momentum, exactly what he said, in order to get to the core goal of, of defeating al-Qaeda. And then the third uh, objective was increasing the capacity of the Afghan National Security Forces. Those three things, I think, are very achievable objectives. And by boosting resources in this really uh, massive way, I think, I, I agree with you, Graham, I think it really gets, you have a match now, and um, it's gonna have to unfold. The, fun, the one point I wanna make, though, is that the easy part is meeting and deliberating, coming up with a policy and making a speech. The really, really hard part started yesterday, the implementation, and it's gonna be really tough. And the next 12 months especially are gonna be really tough. And you know, when you're behind that resolute desk in the Oval Office, you gotta be resolute. And um, I give the President the benefit of the doubt here, but I know some people are commenting on the speech saying, you know, he didn't really show that we're really in this to succeed. Um, but it's gonna, the next 12 months are gonna be very difficult. And you're not gonna be able to have another strategy review every six months if things don't go right. You just need to see it through. I think you're certainly right to remind us that beneath the slogans here, there's a lot of operational detail that matters a whole lot. In fact, I just to make a comment myself, I'd say one of the most impressive, whether you agree or disagree, one of the most impressive conclusions of this extensive review that he undertook was that whereas the noise from the, or not the noise, the, the, uh, the plan from the Pentagon for when the 40,000 people were going to be deployed by McChrystal's plan would have had the last combat brigade getting there in 2011. And he was thinking, wait a minute, excuse me, we're, this is a crisis, we need people now, why are they coming in 2011? And so now, there are gonna be folks arriving there before Christmas, and all of the troops are supposed to be there by I think the end of March or beginning of April. So uh, that, now the logistics of that and the challenge, if you're sitting there doing planning in the Pentagon, is huge, but that's an operational detail as an example that came out through this process, which I think actually advances the chance of, of things being accomplished. Let me, let me go back to, to, uh, to then a little bit more academic conversation if I can, because here we have people that are part of the analytic community uh, here in the university. And if we ask kind of what is the sort of stuff we study and analyze have to do with informing the kinds of choices the president and the, and the national security team were debating, um, there, we have a colleague at uh, BU, uh, uh, Professor Vesevich, uh, who's a historian, a thoughtful historian and who has a quite a contrary view to President Obama's. And he, he so the, 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 the analytically, the question is, uh, what does a counter, what, what does sending troops to Afghanistan and a surge of troops to Afghanistan have to do with defeating Al-Qaeda? So the argument is, there was these Al-Qaeda guys that attacked us on 9-11. These are Islamic extremists of whom now the numbers are dwindling because they've been being captured or killed. And the estimate now from the Pentagon is that there's fewer than 100 of these folks in Afghanistan and 1,000 or so in Pakistan, unfortunately including the two top dogs, Osama bin Laden and, and Zawahiri. But these numbers have been being diminished by a pretty intense counter and terror a counter-terrorist campaign that includes special forces and even these predators that fly around and zap people with missiles. 
killing people regularly. So 14 of the top 20 leaders in this group have died in the past year, according to the Pentagon uh, uh, information. So Besevich says, have, have we gotten confused here and we're confusing territory with terrorists? So the people that we're against are terrorists, but now what do they have to do with Afghanistan? So to, to even press it a little further, if most of the terrorists are in Pakistan, and if our job is to eliminate the terrorists, what is having 30,000 more troops and therefore 100,000 troops in Afghanistan have to do with it? And similarly, if the, if the, if the worry is, well, if we leave, they might come back to Afghanistan, well, but what about all the other places they might go? And in Pakistan, we're not proposing to send troops into Pakistan to deal with the... So if, if the strategy we're using for attacking the terrorists in Pakistan is okay without sending troops to Pakistan, why is some analogous strategy to that not appropriate for Afghanistan? I don't know. Rory, what would you say? Um, I, mean, look, I, I, I will meet deep disagreement on this panel on this. I don't think the president is convinced by the idea that this is vital in terms of a counter-terrorist strategy. I think the reason why we are increasing in Afghanistan doesn't have a great deal to do with terrorism. I think the reason we are increasing is that it would be embarrassing to withdraw, embarrassing to withdraw for a range of reasons. I mean, embarrassing because we have allies in Pakistan, because it would be perceived as a defeat because it would lead to a civil war, because there would be an enormous amount of suffering amongst Afghans. So broadly speaking, if we can avoid withdrawing, we would prefer to do so. But I don't think the president, although he does use the word vital national interest, you heard him stumble over the vital there. He's trying to cap the number of troops. I mean, a great deal of this is about setting out arguments about why he's not going to send any more. And the reason he isn't going to send any more is that he does not actually believe this is an existential threat to the United States. He's largely sending the troops because he somehow allowed McChrystal to get away and write this report. And once the report was written, he was boxed in. Uh, so what the president is doing, I think, is trying to resolve his intuitions, which are it would be unfortunate to withdraw, not because we have such an overwhelming obligation or an overwhelming interest that we must remain regardless of the cost, but because we have some kind of obligation, some kind of interest, and if we were able to avoid a withdrawal, that would be preferable. And at the same time, a real desire to stop an increase in troops that should be disproportional to American interests. So my sense is that Basevich's criticisms are absolutely correct, and that the president himself might not be that confident in drawing all the links that you can attempt to draw between counterinsurgency, state building, fighting the Taliban, and the threat from Al Qaeda. So but, Ted, what's wrong with that? I'm going to agree with part of what you say, though, Rory, so I'm not going to be completely against it, because I, I do believe that there there is a real sense of doubt in lots of people's mind in the administration and around the world on whether or not this thing is uh, a counterterrorism to the point where al-Qaeda is the major threat and the major reason why we send forces there. But the forces are being sent there because the Taliban now has become a, a more dominant and prevalent problem to the stability of Afghanistan. And we have some sense of responsibility, at least came out in the president's speech, to provide that stability to Afghanistan before we depart. And I think that's one of the major reasons why we're sending those forces. Now, I think there's another piece that we don't see, and I would hope that there's lots of activity going on at a very highly classified level in terms of what it is we're going to be able to do with the Pakistanis when we put that uh, addition, additional combat brigade on the border and some type of coordination that's going to go on between the Pakistanis and the coalition forces. And I suspect that we will see a lot more activity in some form that's going to go after al-Qaeda and some of those elements of the Taliban that we think are part of the violent extremist problem. Well, that's a good forecast to watch. Uh, Megan or Brett, what do you all say? Sure. Uh, yes. Let me make two points. The first to your question of why we're sending more troops to Afghanistan if al-Qaeda is the problem. I would say what happens 
in Afghanistan has a direct implication for what happens in Pakistan. And as you have said yourself, um, the real game here is in Pakistan. And so, of course, if you took Afghanistan off this planet and suspended it in space, then we'd have a whole different situation. But the reality is that we don't have all the levers that we might want in a perfect world to influence events in Pakistan. We have much more room to maneuver in Afghanistan, and there is a relationship between what happens in Afghanistan and what happens in Pakistan. And again, going back to this kind of fundamental assumption that I think people um, must be in agreement with to endorse this, this strategy as the President laid it out, is that if Afghanistan falls to the Taliban, this will be destabilizing for Pakistan and will be, a, a, you know, will be useful for Al-Qaeda increasing its strength. Um, the second point I'd want to make, just you know, to be controversial, really? um, or a little bit, and, and, and I don't really weight this nearly with the same amount of weight as the first point, but I don't think that all hosts, all host countries are the same for Al-Qaeda. I think that Al-Qaeda in East Timor, not that I have any reason to say East Timor, is not the same as Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan or Pakistan. I think there, that the Taliban is a different host for Al-Qaeda than other groups around the world. So I, I agree that there may be problems in other countries later, but the Al-Qaeda residing within the Taliban, within Afghanistan, within Pakistan, is drawing on very long relationships, is drawing on cultural traditions of hospitality that make it um, a, a challenge that may be greater were we to, to push out Al-Qaeda into another culture or another country. So Britt, you want to I'll just here? say, uh, I think when they had this debate internally, and they had it, I think for months, one of the reasons this went on, can we do this, e can it be easier? We have drones, we're zapping people out of the sky, as you said, so do we really need to put all these boots on the ground, put Americans in harm's way? And they wanted the answer to be yes. But operationally, you can't do it that way. You I mean, cannot. There be, no, be no. Right. You, you, you can't, need. without a presence on the ground in Afghanistan, you cannot zap al-Qaeda people out of the sky because you don't know who they are. The Pakistanis working very closely with their intelligence services and their military services to get the intelligence to be operational, to be able to use drones effectively. Um, but why can't we just pull back and kind of manage this in a tolerable level of violence? This is the epicenter of transnational terrorism. And Secretary Gates was convincing today in his testimony, because he was asked this question, and it's, I think it's the answer they came out with in the Situation Room. This is the epicenter. They defeated these movements, these extremist groups, defeated a superpower here, and they cannot be seen to do it again. It is not the argument that there's al-Qaeda in Somalia, they're diffuse now, so therefore why are we investing so much resources in this part of the world? Because this is the critical part of the world on this issue, which threatens us. On the two sides of the border, uh, very briefly, um, again, the situation in Pakistan is different, and that's why the guts of the speech are very good. It's a military strategy in Afghanistan, it's a civilian strategy in Afghanistan, and it's a st strategic partnership with Pakistan. We need to increase the Afghan capacity to handle the Taliban problem, and we need to work with the Pakistanis who, are, Pakistanis who already have tremendous capacity to be even stronger to go after these guys. And he said in the speech, the Pakistanis are starting to do that. But we have to shift the Pakistani threat perception from India to the terrorist problem. And to do that, they have to know we have their back, not just now or five years from now, but for the next 20 and 30 years. And the Pakistanis don't believe us. We abandoned them for 10 years. And part of that speech was to reassure the Pakistanis. And to get back to the first point of this panel, one of the problems with the speech is that the unintended consequence of the timeline is that the Pakistanis are now questioning that very commitment. Well, let's stay with Pakistan, because I think that the, I think most of us who tried to think about it would say the big game is in Pakistan. Afghanistan happens to share a long border with uh, Pakistan. There seem, the, there's a significant ungoverned territory that washes between the two. But if I listen to uh, at least what I can tell, uh, you know, Pakistan is many, many different voices too, and is a mess. But if I listen to their voices before, I hear some that seem to think more troops is a good thing, and some that think that it's a bad thing. If I listen to their voices since the speech, I hear almost silence from the government. So I haven't heard anything from uh, Kayemi, I haven't heard anything from the president. There was a modest statement that came out of the, if I saw in the paper today, uh, uh, the, the government. Uh, um, and then if I listen to the noises, they sound to be as much 
oh my goodness, things are worse. Uh, over. Now again, most of the time in many countries, whatever we do, people say things are worse. And so they're always worried. But that with the impact of this, and is the impact of this going to be positive on Pakistan or, or negative? I, let me just, I'll just say very briefly, I think there's just, the history here is important because and when Ryan Crocker was here, he, he gave an address in this forum and, and went through the history of Pakistan. They, they, Pakistan has gone from our most, one of our most central allies in the Cold War, our closest allies, third in military and civilian aid, but behind Israel and Egypt. And then in 1990, a senator, uh, Larry Pressler from North Dakota, who has a degree from this school. A graduate from the Kennedy right? School, yes. Said not, it, you know, not our finest. <laughs> <that's true. laughs> okay. I didn't say that, but okay. <laughs> uh, but there was an, 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 an amendment was passed through the Congress that said, if, unless you can certify that Pakistan is non-nuclear, we have to cut off all this aid. And President Bush, the first President Bush, couldn't do that. And in 1990, everything stopped. And, um, for the Pakistanis up until almost 9-11, uh, uh, we didn't have those mill-to-mill -mill relationships, those important, deep relationships with our allies that we need to rebuild. So we've been trying to rebuild them since 9-11. The Pakistanis still don't trust us. And um, what can we do? It is deepening and enriching that partnership. And um, we just need to keep at it. And whatever the administration can do to correct this misperception that we're only here for 18 months and then you guys are on your own, I think is gonna be critical to Pakistan. Because in order for them to step up and get at um, their own extremist problem, um, they're going to need to know we're behind them for decades. Um, well, let me stay in Pakistan just for a second and ask for other people, because I know you've looked at it and I've tried to look at it. So pa Pakistan, my goodness, com complex country, huge uh, nuclear weapons, uh, very difficult uh, internal situation, weak uh, government, a strong military, maybe as uh, our colleague, uh, friend Barry McCaffrey says, the only load-bearing institution in Pakistan seems to be the military. Uh, so uh, cut off by 1990, absolutely, and feeling abandoned. Uh, president Musharraf uh, is the president after 9-11, uh, who becomes our budding ally, uh, as he tells the story himself. I've heard him tell the story to me directly, and then he put it in his book. He said, after 9-11, the Deputy Secretary of State came to visit him and said, uh, you have two choices. Uh, you can become our ally, or you can be bombed into the Stone Age. And he said, I chose I would be your ally. <laughs> uh, but this is a shotgun arrangement, so I think, uh, uh, if I try to think of the Pakistani suspicion and ambiguity at best about the American relationship before, independent of this. It's deep and complicated. And then within the Pakistani society, there's the feeling among the military that we supported them, and then, well, maybe we didn't, and among the people who are trying to build a democracy, the view is you supported this authoritarian regime of Musharraf for a long time and not, okay. so I'd say you get this, this cauldron now, into that cauldron comes our attempt to have an impact by going, doing something in Afghanistan. I have a hard time figuring out how to net it out to see what comes to be positive and what comes to be negative. I don't know. Rory, you, you look at that scene. Okay, so broadly speaking, I, my, my sense on the Afghanistan-Pakistan link is there are some positive connections, there are some negative connections, but generally the connections are less than we believe. The problems of Pakistan lie in Pakistan and are not going to be solved through Afghanistan. I, I mean, without seeming sort of vulgar or barnstorming on this, I mean, my sense would be that if for half the amount of political capital, energy, and thought which has gone into this Afghanistan project had gone into trying to resolve Kashmir, we would be in a much better situation, not just in Pakistan, but in the whole of South Asia over the next 20 or 30 years. So one of the real frustrations, if one's trying to think in grand strategic political terms, is that here is a president, here's an administration so obsessed, largely for domestic political reasons, with Al-Qaeda, extravagant responses, short-termism, that they've missed the big game. 
the big and exciting game, the big thing that might have been done was Kashmir, and that would have a much, I suppose, more favorable effect. Okay. Bigger ideas here. Ed, what do you say? You're smiling? Well, just to follow up on, on Rory, I think another piece of the puzzle that uh, I would like to have had the president recognize a little bit more is the role that India plays, not only in Af Afghanistan, but in Pakistan as well. And it seems to me that we have not stood up to the Indians in this particular area in terms of their appropriate relationship with Afghanistan and what could be done to help the Pakistanis at least not look 99% at the Indian border and spend a little bit more time looking at the Afghan border. I reckon you, you've actually thought about the Indian connection too. So sure, and, and I, I don't find much to disagree with here. I think certainly if you gave this administration, the last administration, the opportunity or the option for making significant progress on the Kashmir front, that would be con seen as a very considerable um, endeavor. The Bush administration worked with Pakistan, but the problem in getting the sort of cooperation that was desired was that the Bush administration largely tried to provide incentives to Pakistan, to get Pakistan to change its behavior, to look at extremism on its western border as the primary threat rather than to look east. And so the Bush administration tried to do that without addressing the underlying insecurities. And the underlying insecurities have to do with India. And so going to Brett's point, which I think is exactly the right point, um, I'm of the view of that the timeline is really what the Pakistanis are reacting to because it just, it just hits their button of all the times that they feel that America has been a fickle partner. And so that we should be looking positively, well, what can we do to overcome that? And I think, unfortunately, you're looking at something that would be as large as uh, investing more in this India-Pakistan relationship. The problem, as most of us know, is this sounds a lot easier than it is. Um, that India has been historically very allergic to external involvement in the Kashmir issue. And I think that thus far we haven't seen this administration or the previous administration be able to translate the new strategic partnership that you know, the United States does have with India into one in which there is some leverage over India to really engage on the Kashmir issue in a way that might alleviate some of these Pakistani insecurities. So I think it's something to strive for. I'm confident that people in the administration are very cognizant that this would be the real win. I also think um, that it's a good thing that we're not hearing about it because if we, would hear, if we were hearing about it, it would be a surefire thing that it's not gonna work. So um, I'm hoping that it's happening and we just uh, don't know about it and can't talk about it on stage. Uh, just to follow up a little bit on, on Megan's point, um, I mean, it's true, Kashmir is unbelievably difficult. The amount of political capital you would need, particularly to take on Indian lobbies in Congress, the amount of political capital you'd need to try to push this through would be enormous. But compared to the political capital we're spending on Afghanistan, the investment in Afghanistan, the brains, the resources, the troops that we put into Afghanistan, I, I do think that that kind of effort directed towards Kashmir we might have got further. I mean, I'm not saying it's easy. Again, I'm just saying we're looking at the wrong thing, as usual. I mean, uh, yeah. No, I'm just saying, you, I, I, says, I'm agreeing with you. You just need an Indian partner. And we just haven't heard yet. Yeah. <laughs> Prime Minister Singh, the Indian Prime Minister, was in, uh, in Washington as the first state visit last week. Uh, and uh, certainly from the things that were heard, there was not any evidence of this. But Megan is certainly right that if something that. really significant was happening, we would not yet have, have heard about it. Uh, get your questions ready, please. I'm gonna do just one last question, but there's microphones here on the ground floor and in the first loges. Less than a minute each. It's now uh, July 2011, and the president says we've started the transition uh, to the withdrawal. Uh, one, uh, over the six months from July to the end of 2011, is there a significant reduction in the number of American troops in Afghanistan? And two, what kind of Afghanistan do we leave? The downside of being directly on your left. Um, well, Ted says no, 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 he's no, ready. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. Um, <laughs> I, I think, and I'll do this under a minute, I think the situation in July 
2011 is one in which the security situation has improved, but there is very little Afghan capacity to which to transfer responsibility. And I therefore will predict that the number of American troops will not go down dramatically over the second half of 2011. Um, and if that is the case, then we will still be in Afghanistan and therefore we will have not left behind in Afghanistan at that point. Um, I would think that the, the reality is the situation in 2011 is, is really disturbing. I mean, if, if you look at what the president has laid out, on the positive side, he's saying that he wants to deny the Taliban the, the ability to overthrow the government. That actually, in practice, I mean, if you think about what that will actually look like, that'll probably mean, reading between the lines, enormous Taliban control of huge swathes of the territory. He says he wants to reverse the momentum and stop them from taking Kabul or somehow taking over the country. But you can imagine a situation implied within that where the Taliban are in many, many places. And the question then is, how do we deal with this? You can already see discussions going on, for example, in Nangraha about funding militias, funding governors such as Gulaga Shirzai. What on earth is this project going to look like? Now that we no longer talk about a stable, effective, legitimate, credible state, but instead talk about backing the Afghan National Security Forces and reversing the momentum of the Taliban and keeping the pressure up on Al-Qaeda. What does this country look like? And the answer is, it sounds a little bit like Somalia. I, I mean, I, the, the strategy is one year to reverse the momentum and reset the trajectory, uh, another 12 to 24 months to consolidate what we've done, and that means really boosting Afghan national security forces. But that's going to take more than uh, 24 months. But I do think by July 2011, our forces will begin to come down. Um, I think the levels of violence will be down. The long pole in the tent, however, are the Afghan national security forces, and I think we're going to need to do two things. I think we're going to need an agreement with the Afghan government, not just Karzai, but also the local power brokers, um, through the Afghan parliament, of a long-term, sustainable US presence in Afghanistan. It's going to outlast this administration, if Obama serves two terms. Um, and it's going to last for decades and decades. And secondly, which we haven't talked about, is the sustainability of the Afghan National Security Forces, just the price tag. Afghanistan's entire national budget is about $1 billion. Yes. And what the administration is projecting for an Afghan National Security Force of, if they go to 400,000, which is the top end, is about $10 billion a year to sustain that force. So that is going to require an inter international commitment, um, which right now is not really apparent. Now, the international commitment has to come in funding this sustainable, the tail of these forces to sustain themselves, um, not so much international troops. Okay. Basically agree that we will be able to re pull out some forces in 2011, but the forces that we will pull out in 2011 will be conveniently coming from those areas where we can declare some sort of stability and turned over the security responsibility to the Afghan uh, police forces or their military forces. Those numbers in my thought process will not be high, but the vector will be correct. And in some way, we'll be able to validate you know, the, the president's declaration that we are pulling forces out. OK, well, we, uh, one of the virtues of the forum is that they keep these tapes, and so we'll uh, God willing, have a chance to look and look and see how we did. Uh, the rules of the uh, of the forum are uh, uh, questions are short. In with the question mark. Introduce yourself first. We'll start with this gentleman. Uh, I'm Michael Brower. I have a PhD from Harvard and studied at the Kennedy School before John Kennedy was president, as you Graham know. Um, I rise to protest the militarization of American foreign policy and of American society and even of the Kennedy School. I come to these forums once or twice a month. I hear eloquent, brilliant speakers, almost all on the military side. One half of the American national budget goes to the military, more than every other country in the world combined. General Dwight David Eisenhower warned us over half a century ago about the military-industrial complex. Yet I come to these forums and I don't hear any criticism of the military-industrial complex or 
of the Kennedy School. So my question, I know the rules are I have to, Good. a question for the panel. When are you ladies and gentlemen going to start examining critically what I regard as the fallacious, stupid myth that the solution to the problems of the world lies with American military? Okay. <laughs> A clear, my question, a, clear, a clear question, and we've got it. Uh, my I think, question for you, Mr. Allison, please. is when is the Kennedy School going to give us panelists and speakers who examine those same stupid myths that there are military solutions? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I, I, think, uh, I think the members of this panel, I don't know about all the panels here every night, but the members of this panel uh, uh, didn't know previously, and maybe Ted as a former general, uh, but Rory, I think, for the first time has been uh, either demoted or elevated into the ranks of the military industrial complex. So I'll leave that <laughs> argument aside for the second. But I think addressing the issue, that the question raised, is, is it, is it because we have a huge military hammer that we go around and think every problem is a nail. So what about well, I, I mean, I, I think, I mean, it, it is a very interesting question. I mean, one of the problems has been that, particularly for humanitarian aid agencies in Afghanistan, has been the definition of our engagement in terms of security interests. You notice that the president, although he may well think that one of the reasons to be in Afghanistan may be the humanitarian interests of the Afghan people, in other words, preventing a civil war, that gets quite short shrift because he keeps asserting the only reason, really, for us to be there and have troops on the ground is because it's a vital national security interest in the United States. This means that 95% of the money on the ground is money associated with those kinds of issues. If you're applying at the moment for a grant from USAID, I was talking to people from Mercy Corps and Save the Children who are doing this at the moment, they need to tick boxes in counterinsurgency in order to get money to do what would be considered conventional aid and development programs in health and education. This strange development, whereby counterinsurgency has ballooned, so that the counterinsurgency doctrine now reads a little bit like a World Bank policy statement. In other words, General Petraeus talks about rule of law, talks about civil society, talks about education, talks about health, creates a real issue, because that kind of comprehensive approach a risks, I suppose, compromising every side. In fact, one of the peculiar things about a comprehensive approach is that Karzai is tarred with the brush of us, we're tarred with the brush of Karzai, the humanitarian agency, agencies take money from the DOD, but at the same time, DOD gets some support from the humanitarian agencies for their kinds of operations. So I think it is a very, very interesting and powerful question, and I do think there would be quite a number of people who would say that there is a possibility for a relationship with a country like Afghanistan, which de 9 11 it. In other words, which instead of framing our interests and our activities in Afghanistan in terms of dealing with Al-Qaeda, frames it instead broadly in terms of a humanitarian project, began to think about Afghanistan the way we might think about Nepal, might think about Congo, might think about Chad, uh, and that in fact the focus on security interest may in fact mislead us and create endless actions of bad faith. We have lots of questions. So what I'd propose is if you have a strong agree or disagree, please do it briefly, Ted. Yeah. Well, just a quick response to the, to the question. If, if you were to ask uh, military people around the world, especially US military, uh, whether or not they ought to be uh, planting wheat in parts of Afghanistan today or whether they ought to be building schools, the answer is, is the United States military never thought that that was going to be a mission. So you have to ask the, the chicken and the egg question on whether or not because the military had the capability they were given the job, or was it because that we were looking for somebody out there and nobody else would do it. So I, you know, just enough there, we could take that on a long mm -hmm. ways. Just my, quickly, yeah. my comment was very the similar same? to Ted's, Good. that we're actually further down the road that I think you would like us to go on. The thinking in foreign policy has firmly embrace the idea that none of these conflicts are solved primarily through military means. 
However, we don't yet have adequate civilian capabilities. And so we get the situation that General Olstrom de uh, describes, where you have the military doing a lot of things that we would prefer civilians to do. So I think in some case, and we do talk about this in our classes, um, the importance of building, building a civilian component to our government, and that's behind the ideas of things like the Civilian Reserve Corps and supporting that in Congress, encouraging Congress to allocate money for that so we could really put some resources into building up uh, capability so that our foreign policy can be more balanced. It's a, it's a fascinating uh, 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 imbalance, and I think if you, if you try to think of it, if there are 26, how many million Afghans? Let's see, 26, 28? So and they have a per capita income of about 250 bucks. So if we gave them 1,000 bucks a piece, that costs 26 billion. About 100,000 troops will cost us 100 billion. So we could actually give them 4,000 a piece. So if you try to do the numbers, it's just, it's always way out of proportion. And I think as we try to look at the, at, at who can go, when the State Department decides that we're gonna have to send a, a, a civilian surge, the numbers of people that are coming are 400, 300, 800, 600. The agronomists, I was at the conversation with Dick Holbrook a couple of weeks ago. We're gonna do farming in Afghanistan. That's crucial. How many farmers have we got to go there? 61, okay. and how much is a combat brigade? 5,000, so the military being a place where if you give an order, the people salute and go, is quite different than almost all the other parts of the U.S. government, and therefore often gets called on, as Megan says, to do things that they weren't volunteering to do and they wouldn't prefer to do, but... And we'd prefer someone else. And we would prefer someone, and somebody else might even be skilled to do. This gentleman. Yes, sir. This might be a little awkward uh, follow-up question. You're pleased to answer any, ask I'm, any question you'd like. Introduce yourself. I'm Colonel Pat Donahoe, United States Army, uh, one of the National Security Fellows here Good. with uh, General Olstrom. And first of all, I'd like to applaud the uh, Kennedy School and Harvard University for uh, really allowing the military point of view to, to hold equal, equal weight and equal footing. So thank you. My question is... Uh, my question is one, we have a tale of two surges when you look at a uh, strategic communications standpoint. Uh, the Bush surge into Iraq in 2007 uh, was, uh, was begun with a speech, uh, much like the one we had on Tuesday night, uh, but it really, really uh, foreshadowed an increase of about a 20% increase in troop level. Under President Obama, we've had a, a threefold increase in the number of U.S. troops in, in uh, Afghanistan, and we had a very lukewarm, tepid speech on Tuesday night over the, over the results we wanted to get from that. I was wondering from the policymakers, what, what, do, you, what do you take from that? What do you account for that? Okay. That's a very interesting one. And this is something Megan has thought a lot about. Megan, what, what's your two cents? I think it, it comes very much down to the issue of multiple audiences. Every president in this situation has multiple audiences. And um, President Bush and Brett and I were there for many of these deliberations. He was aware that he had multiple audiences in delivering his speech on the Iraq surge, and he chose to address one audience, the audience that he felt, or really two audiences, the audience that he prioritized, which was our military and our adversaries in the region. And so he came out sort of unequivocal, um, recognizing that there would be a domestic political cost. Now, to be fair, he, to President Obama, President Bush was in an easier situation. The American economy was different uh, then than it is now. President Bush wasn't facing an election. So they're not equal decisions or equal choices, but I think that President Bush did decide, I will take the hit from the domestic side. His approval rating, I think at the time, was maybe 27%, 30%. He was pretty low in the polls already. Um, whereas I think President Obama really sought uh, to, to make a, both audiences happy or multiple audiences happy. And that is what I think we saw in the speech and that's where I think people get conflicting messages. Um, so I, again, I think if you put just the numbers and the magnitude as you described, uh, you would think that these statements would make an equal impression on the region, on the world, on the country. Um, but a lot of this is about psychology and a lot of this is about presentation. And I think um, you, you have two very different presidents with different calculations. 
unless strongly disagree, I'll take another question. Or do very, it, very quick, please. Pat, just very quickly. I mean, my, my only instinct is that, that I do believe Obama is trying to cap. He's trying to stop himself from sending any more. So one of the reasons why the rhetoric is so muted, why there's so little big talk, is that he's trying to move away from an idea that this is an existential threat. Whereas President Bush was almost saying the opposite. He was almost saying, what do you need? I'll give you that and more. We're going to go and do this. We're going to win. I, I, my suspicion is President Obama doesn't want to put himself into that rhetorical landscape. He wants to try to talk about a, a much more moderate measured policy worldwide, and therefore he has a more muted tone. That's Gentleman in the lounge, please. Um, hi, my name is Soheb Athar. I'm a student at the Kennedy School. I'm also from Pakistan, so this is slightly relevant. Great. Um, one of the one of the things in the uh, in the new strategy is uh, more uh, unmanned aerial vehicle drone strikes into Pakistan, more targets, more areas, more strikes in general. Uh, till now, the U.S. has not faced much backlash uh, for this uh, uh, strategy, except a few uh, protests in in Pakistan and some an general uh, anti anti Americanism. My question is, how sustainable do you think this strategy is, considering there was also a, a senior U.S. Uh, a U.N. official who said that it sort of is a violation of international law, and uh, there might be some consensus building around the world that this strategy is not a very uh, uh, strategic uh, way to go about these things. Do you think this, this can continue for a long time? Good, good question. Uh, who wants to address that? Go ahead. Yeah. I'll take, take a quick shot. I, my own personal opinion is, is that whether we want it or not, we're going to see a lot more UAVs used in combat around the world, not just in Pakistan. And uh, the second point is, is that I think the Pakistani government has, has permitted this quite openly, even though it may not be as obvious in the open press, but certainly uh, in the arrangements that we have with the Pakistani government, they have certainly looked at that as being one of the things that they will accept. And it, it seems to have had quite a bit of success if you take a look at numbers, whether those numbers are right or wrong in terms of, of uh, reaching out and, and getting to some of those high profile Al-Qaeda, in some cases, the insurgents. Disagree? Um, very quickly, I mean, I think it's a very interesting point. I mean, of course, because these things, we don't acknowledge these predator drone attacks, so that formally within international law, the state of them is very odd. We're trying to say these people are enemy combatants of the government of Pakistan, and we're operating with the consent of the government of Pakistan. But there are no formal treaty obligations because we don't acknowledge that we're doing it. Given that we don't acknowledge that we're doing it, you could also, from a very narrow human rights law point of view, present it as extrajudicial execution. You could say that, in fact, there is no due process taking place, and we're simply eliminating people on hearsay. So I think one thing that's certainly clear is that it would be very useful to be more open about these issues and to try to work out what the rules of war are in these kinds of situations, rather than trying to sweep it under the carpet. I think it's an extremely interesting question, and I don't disagree with anything here, but I think from an American point of view, and I'm sort of quintessential, uh, I can almost only think from an American point of view, it sounds like a great idea that here a drone flies around, finds a bad guy, it zaps him. You know, maybe from time to time there's some collateral damage, but in any case, the ch checklist is going down. I think if I put myself in the position of a Pakistani, and I'm living there and something is flying around and it's zapping somebody in my space, uh, I would probably have a different view about the subject. So I, I think it'll, I think the, I would say, watch this space. This one's going to continue. This gentleman. I'm Reg McCain of the Harvard Institute for Learning and Retirement. And I want to focus us, at least briefly, on uh, benchmarks. In March, I heard from the president. Um, well, he promised that eventually he'd tell us what benchmarks he would expect of the Afghan and Pakistan governments um, if they wanted us to continue pouring out uh, huge billions of dollars to them to spend in ways that harm our, um, um, as it turns out, um, our efforts to fight the war on, on terror. Now, um, here it is, um, his second announcement uh, his second major speech this year on Afghanistan. Um, um, I don't hear the word, uh, I don't know what the benchmarks are. I don't, hear, I don't hear the word anymore. If we don't know what the benchmarks are, or even if any exist, 
then we don't know what the strategy is. So, final sentence. Um, so, isn't Obama asking us, asking the citizens to have a blind trust in his administration to, in effect, give him a blank check? Good question. Who would like to answer that one? I can just, on benchmarks, it's interesting because kind of where you stand is where you sit. I mean, when we were in the Bush administration, uh, Senator Clinton, Senator Obama, the Congress were hammering us for specific benchmarks on Iraq. I think when you're sitting in the executive branch and you have to execute what is going to be a very uncertain strategy, you're going into a realm of uncertainty, you don't want to be tied to specific benchmarks. And I think that it was interesting that we haven't heard much about benchmarks. I do know internally they have all sorts of metrics across the board, which they're measuring you know, every day. And I think the pressure is going to come from the Congress to have these public. I mean, it's going to be inevitable. But, but it's a very interesting observation that right now you do not hear talk of specific benchmarks. Um, and there was nothing in the speech about benchmarks. It was very, I mean, the speech really was a very high level strategic speech. I think it's important to read McChrystal's report, important to listen to what the Secretary said today to get a real holistic understanding of the operational components of the strategy. Um, but I don't think the administration wants to be tied down to we have to meet these specific benchmarks because um, it's just inevitable that things will change, circumstances will change, and you're not going to be able to meet all of them. And sometimes things will go better than you think, which weren't on the list of benchmarks. And then you end up saying, yeah, but look at the success here, even though it's not on the benchmark list. And it gets kind of ridiculous. I would just again do a footnote. Uh, for those of you who were here, for Speaker Pelosi's uh, forum a couple of weeks ago. One of the most interesting features was precisely about this. And she said the hardest vote that uh, she had had to win in the uh, House of Representatives was not the health uh, vote, but was the vote simply for the supplemental for the troops in Iraq and Afghanistan. That was the hardest lift. Uh, and that looking forward, she thought it was going to be even harder. And so benchmarks will certainly come back in that context. This gentleman. I'm Jeff Stone. I conduct dialogues for local communities on racial and ethnic diversity and civic engagement and police community relations. Uh, let's stay with Pakistan, as you said, Dr. Uh, Allison, a, a little while ago. Uh, a few days ago, I was reading two side-by-side -side articles. I, I printed them out. They were about four pages each. One was by, I think it was Peter Brooks of the Heritage Foundation, and the title was something like, We Have to Stay the Course and We Must Stay and Win. And the other article was by, I can't remember the person's name, it was uh, uh, in the publication In These Times, and it was titled Get Out Now. And they had 180 degree differences about the impact of increasing our presence on Pakistan. One said, uh, Mr. Brooks said, that if we don't win, or words to that effect, uh, against the Taliban, that, and if we uh, withdraw, the impact will be to embolden and strengthen the Taliban and destabilize Pakistan. The other gentleman said exactly the opposite, that if we increase our presence, we will aggravate already existing anti-American uh, sentiment in Pakistan and destabilize Pakistan. So what I would like to hear is from the panel, if you take one side, or the other side. I'd like to see some sparks between uh, panelists. We haven't seen too many sparks. Uh, everybody's been agreeing with reservations. So um, uh, I'd be curious if, uh, you know, if there's some difference good, in opinion. Good question. So stabilize or destabilize? What do you think? Well, I, I'm, I'm afraid I, I did try to answer this question, which is to say that I think it's very dangerous to think that Afghanistan has huge impact on Pakistan, either negatively or positively. Pakistan's problems, Pakistan's solutions will come from within Pakistan and from issues such as Kashmir. I mean, this is why I'm obsessed with the idea that one of the problems with talking about an Afghanistan-Pakistan strategy is that you begin to justify all your eccentric activities in Afghanistan on the grounds that you're somehow doing something for Pakistan. Because we all acknowledge that Pakistan is six times more important than Afghanistan, is larger, that's where Al-Qaeda is, that's where the nuclear bombs are. It's very useful in branding terms to claim that what you're doing in Afghanistan is somehow beneficial to your policy in Pakistan. But broadly speaking, I would say, with the resources at our disposal and with our energy, if our focus was on Pakistan, we should focus more directly on Pakistan itself and not attempt to come in through the back door. How about a disagree if it's a spark? 
Please. Um, I think I also tried to make my view on this quite clear. I I'm not arguing that if you make things better in Afghanistan that you're going to improve the situation or fix the situation in Pakistan. I am arguing that if things go further south in Afghanistan, that will add additional complications to an already very complicated situation in Pakistan. So I do think these two things are related, um, and I will leave it at that. Good. Lady in the, in the loge, please. Thanks. Hi, my name is Mubarak Imam. I'm a student at uh, the Kennedy School in the MPID program, and I'm also from Pakistan. I just love your perspective. So far, we've been talking about it from the US angle. But if you were the head of the ISI, how would you interpret Obama's speech? And what would you do, um, which is different than what would the US want you to do? So, Very, very good question. Very hard question. OK, so you, uh, I don't know, been ele <laughs> ele ele elevated or demoted. But in any case, you're the head of the ISI. You've heard this speech, and you're trying to do the net assessment. What, what do we say? I just, I first just want to, I, I had the honor of t teaching a study group here at the, at the Kennedy School this semester, and the diversity of students here, from military, certainly, but from all around the world, diplomats, NGO workers, is extraordinary. I don't know any other place like it. So I just, it is really quite something. You get it from the, the questions here. Um, I think if I was the head of the ISI, I'd try to do what the Pakistanis have been doing for 30 years and play a bit of a double game and, and work with us, but also hedge and um, foment you know, jihadist tendencies in Kashmir to protect against um, the threat coming from the east in India. And um, don't trust the US. Never trust the United States. I think that would still be my position. <laughs> Okay. Agree or disagree? I would agree. I would just say I'd be hedging more today than I was three days ago. Sorry, you'd be? I would be hedging more today than I was three days ago. Wow. Okay. It's lady in the loge. Hi. Um, my name is Nadia Naviwala. I'm an MPP, too. Um, my question goes against my own DC background, but reflects the time that I've spent in Pakistan. Um, first of all, I think the idea that uh, we need to prove to Pakistan that we're in this for the long haul. Um, the whole Pressler idea is kind of an old tune. And increasingly, this relationship has gone from one where Pakistan f wanted and felt it was a partner and wanted the US as a friend to one where they're realizing that they're a client um, of the United States. And the amount of power and money that the US has brought into Islamabad has really changed the dynamics of the relationship and what we're doing there. So how are we going to plan for kind of or maybe even what's currently going on, but a future where Pakistan is increasingly going to take an isolationist approach in calculating its interests and acting them out, which is going to become easier as we withdraw from Afghanistan. And just secondly, I think if we're having this discussion here and this debate about what our vital interests are, um, I just wonder what we keep talking about. We need Pakistan to realize that these are its interests and this is how to achieve them. But obviously, we are fighting for American national interests. And Obama said himself, we need to. Built, do nation building here, not over there. And why shouldn't the Pakistanis realize that, I mean, th that they have their national interests? And I think that's why you see this kind of um, mismatch between this duplicity that we call. It's them acknowledging their national interests. Um, we're not the ones fighting this war. It's their military. We're not the ones going through the bombings, which are happening at a rate of almost every other day and has completely changed that country. And just one final thing, if we can't get our, log our logic here of what we're doing, it's extremely, extremely difficult to explain our logic of what we are doing to Pakistanis. It's nearly impossible. So that's either a barometer of our failure to develop a logic, or it's we need to come up with a better narrative and con convey it. OK, thank you. It's a very uh, complicated question, but I think the point is clear. And let's see, what do we say? Yeah. I, I just pick up on the very last point, which is to say that it's absolutely true. Our inability to get it clear in Afghanistan or Pakistan what exactly we're doing generates these conspiracy theories. I mean, one of the reasons why everybody assumes in Afghanistan that we've come to steal their oil when they don't have any oil, right? Um, <laughs> or to steal the uranium or to sell people in the white slave trade is that they're bewildered. It doesn't make any sense to them. You know, we talk about the most astonishing collection of different objectives from protecting women from Taliban control through to chasing al-Qaeda when al-Qaeda may not actually be in the country. So 
I, I, I really agree. This question, and, and the problem is that what generates it, and what Megan's talked about quite fluently, indeed everyone's talked about quite fluently, is the fact that these domestic political considerations in the United States are perpetually warping the way we talk about our policy, so that the bad faith is intrinsic to the democratic process and makes it very, very difficult to communicate our strategy. Two uh, quick points in response. Uh, again, agreeing with Rory and also with you about our difficulty in communication. I think this is very, very much a problem regarding this timeline. If we in this room don't all understand the nuances of this timeline, that it actually just marks the be beginning of a withdrawal and doesn't mark the end of a withdrawal, imagine how people who don't hear it from President Obama, who don't read it in the New York Times, but hear about it on the radio, hear about it from how the Taliban may present it, how Al-Qaeda may present it, how different governments present it, um, after it's been translated numerous times, this is going to be very confusing. And again, the optics are just going to get worse. But secondly, if I could just respond uh, to your point about interest and just be clear, at least on where I'm coming from. Here, I think um, it's not, and, and, and perhaps I spoke to, uh, imprecisely, but it's not simply that we want to get Pakistan to realize its interests or X and Y. We want to align our national interest and Pakistan's national interest. We want to find uh, a way that we can be working for the same purpose, which um, is, I think, the people who are executing and working on these issues believe is in the mutual interest of Pakistan and the United States. And I think there are a lot of mutual interests between these two countries. And it is an enduring source of frustration that it's been so hard to align them and to get the strength of both countries behind the same common objectives. Okay. This gentleman, please. Great. Um, thank you very much. Um, it's been very insightful. Um, my question to you is. Please to introduce yourself. Oh, my name is Ahmed, Ahmed Jalal. I am a Kennedy School student. Um, the day after President Obama gave the speech, an editorial came in the most liberal anti-Taliban newspaper in Pakistan. This is what it read. The US and West have proved fickle allies. Afghanistan is about to be left on its own devices once again. The world may, however, once again live to regret it. And this is the perception, and this is what is happening in Pakistan. Now, Henry Kissinger once said that a conventional army loses by not winning. A guerrilla army wins by not losing. Given we are faced with a fanatical enemy that is willing to take what it takes to, to wage a war, and the lack of domestic you know, uh, support for the US government to do whatever it takes to fight Taliban and Al-Qaeda. My question to you is, would you think Taliban or Al-Qaeda could be defeated? Extremely good question. Please. I'm, I'm not so sure of the word, uh, you know, defeat. You know, we don't understand exactly what we mean by defeat. There, there is no doubt in my mind that through the basket full of tools, the military being part of it, but certainly the, the, uh, the nation-building piece that we're attempting to do in Afghanistan, uh, certainly the governance piece that we're trying to encourage the Afghanis to pull together their government and governance piece are all part of those tools. And indeed, I believe that you can, if you look at the president's uh, focus, we can reverse the trend and the influence of the Taliban. And in fact, we could probably make the Taliban part of the solution in the long term, which is, which is I think, the way you ought to approach this counterinsurgency piece. And that is not to destroy the Taliban, but in terms provide the conditions by which the Taliban become part of the solution. OK. This lady, uh, please to introduce yourself. OK. Uh, my name is Amtul. I'm a Kennedy School student and also from Pakistan. So okay. I'll try to ask a less complicated question. <laughs> One of the frictions between Pakistan and Afghanistan was the border, and uh, Afghanistan not accepting the border between Pakistan and Afghanistan. One of the insecurities Pakistan army especially felt was the Pashtun nationalism. So is there like anything um, that could be done to uh, clear the border between that so that there will less, less uncertainty in this region? I don't know anybody who's been to that border more often than Rory. So, Rory, what, what about um, what about the what about um, the border? No, I, I think it's a, a good and interesting question. As, as those of you in the room who may not be uh, from the region are um, may not be aware, may be aware 
Uh, the Durand line is an arbitrary line drawn up by a British civil servant in the late 19th century, and the Afghan government still refuses to accept it. In fact, the Afghan government has claims which stretch well into Pakistan and at times, in certain moods, well into Kashmir as well. So this is an issue, right? And uh, finding a way of resolving that, finding a way of agreeing what a frontier might be between Afghanistan and Pakistan, accepting perhaps the current conventional international boundary might be a useful part of resolving the conflict between those two countries. I mean, what we keep coming back to, whether we're talking about India in the way that Tad was earlier, or whether we're talking about Kashmir, or whether we're talking about the Durand line, is that Pakistan is clearly playing the role of a uncomfortable spoiler in the whole situation in Afghanistan. And anything that we can do, diplomatic, strategic, to try to reduce that kind of tension would be useful over decades. Noella is telling us we have a limited amount of time, so we're going to take these last two questions, this lady and this gentleman, and we have to have short questions and short answers if we can, please. Uh, my name is Colonel Deborah Sinnott. I am a National Security Fellow here at Harvard Kennedy School. Thank you. The, the question um, really is a very general question um, for the entire panel. Um, we, we spend a considerable amount of time identifying the complexity of the environment in both Pakistan and Afghanistan. And we spend uh, probably an exponentially more amount of time trying to simplify our policy aims and objectives in these areas. And I would ask them to comment on why our policy needs to be reduced to singular terms when we have all acknowledged that it is multifaceted and complex, and it's the environment of the future. Okay, let me be unfair, and because I think this other gentleman is enthusiastic about asking a question. There's also an yeah. Afghan. Yeah. That's what we're gonna do. We're gonna have, gonna have the, we're gonna have the, uh, you, you will pick one of the questions. We're gonna let each of you put your question briefly, uh, but pick one of the questions that you're gonna answer and we'll go in this order. If you, if somebody answers your question, you've gotta choose another one. So please, okay. introduce, you three, introduce yourself, ask your question briefly, yes. Great. Um, hello, my name's uh, Harry Kennard, I'm a physicist from uh, Wales. Um, my question is very simple. How long will we be uh, talking and be concerned about Islamic extremism in, in general? Great. Very clear question. Very brief. Please. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Saik Shajan from Afghanistan and Afghan lawyers going to Harvard Law School. And my question is why we are not learning from our past eight years that we have spent in Afghanistan. Why we are not avoiding the mistake that we have committed and why we are not repeating those things which has worked for us. If you look at the situation right now on the ground, we have around 100,000 international troops. We have around 90,000 Afghan army, plus 60,000 something Afghan police. And we are still not able to fight the Taliban. Instead of like defeating them, they're day by day increasing and growing in, the, in different parts of Afghanistan. While we look back in 2001, we had only 400 American groups in Bagram Air Base, and there was only Northern Alliance fighting the Taliban, and just it took us seven weeks to withdraw Taliban completely from Afghanistan. Why we are not able to do the same thing right now? And I personally believe that uh, the speech of uh, President Obama was lacking something, although it was very good that he was talking of the partnership with Pakistan. But on the other aspect, there was a strong language was needed. I believe uh, something similar like the Stone Age threat will work. Otherwise, if we send like 30,000 right now, another 60,000 even, I believe this 18 months and the way that we are going right now and the way that Pakistan is playing the double game, I believe we are not uh, going to have any results. And the reason that I'm giving that why Pakistan is playing double game, just very recently, the Pakistani army announced that we have surrounded, and during Vazidistan operation, some Arabs and uh, Uzbeks, but then, like, it has been a month that nobody knows what happened to those Arabs and uh, uh, Uzbeks. So there is still, like, like, playing the double game, and we have to, like, go back and, and use a strong language to Pakistan if we really want to have results in Afghanistan. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So you're getting your questions and your answers ready. The last question. Uh, my name is Javed. I'm a student from Afghanistan too. Um, I have a simple question. This um, timetable, 18 months, is this real or is this just an indirect warning to the Afghan government to behave? If it is, if it is uh, the first one, which is a real one, I think that a real strategy, I think that that's not possible. 
Um, I think that the model has been built on Iraq and in, in one simple thing, simple word, Iraq is flat, so it's possible to round, the, round up the, the, uh, the, uh, the insurgents, but in Afghanistan it's not. So I'm highly doubtful that 30,000 uh, sending 30,000 troops will make a difference in Afghanistan. And if it is, if it is the, a threat, uh, a, a warning to the Afghan government to behave yourself, I think that that's also wishful. Because as much as I know Afghans, the Afghan president will not care about that, and that's not gonna work. So I'm, I just wanna know if some, someone has an um, idea. What is this? To me, I, you know, I, I feel like it's just beginning of leaving Afghanistan. We had so much trouble there. Not gonna work, people are frustrating. Uh, Americans are not gonna pay blood and money overseas for 15 years or 20 years. Thank you. Good, thank you. It's an extraordinary uh, group of people and I'm sorry we, that we have hours at which uh, we therefore have to stop because we could continue this for another hour. But we'll go down the, the line and you can answer one of the questions if you uh, know the answer. And if you don't, you can pass. Maybe, well, sure, can we go in reverse? You want to go in reverse order to let Ted oh, go first? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Megan, is that okay? Okay. I'll, uh, I'll take the, uh, the, the timetable one. And in my belief, all along, is oh, you wanted yes. that one, Brent. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll take the timetable one, because my belief was is that the, the timetable, as mentioned in the president's speech, was there for political reasons much more so than for uh, strategic reasons. I, I think it does serve a value. I, I think it is a warning to the Afghan government, but I also think it's also a, uh, a challenge, if you would, to the United States military, who seem to be uh, having the brunt of the responsibility put on their shoulders. I think uh, missing from this, by the way, is a uh, a sense of responsibility given to the civilian part, which we didn't talk about because we did not talk about a civilian surge, but I think it ought to apply to them as well. So I think there's value to having an 18-month uh, arbitrary date because it provides some challenges, and I hope that people will accept it as a challenge, but I also think that it is not going to be horribly meaningful when it comes down to 18 months from now. Uh, we will have pretty well set things in motion in terms of what we're doing with the surge, and we'll see some opportunities to bring some folks home. Okay. I think one of the questions is how long is this going to last? How long are we going to be? Yeah, I think um, it's just take this part of the world we're talking about now, and if the question is when does this end, how does it end? The answer, I hope, this never ends. Um, uh, you know, the American people, we, we lack patience, we lack strategic vision. And when I say this never ends, I mean we need to be committed and engaged in this part of the world for the rest of our lifetimes. That does not mean with 100,000 troops, but it means uh, with civilian assistance and capacity development. Our military relationships, we hope, with sovereign host nation governments will be like it is with the Philippines or Colombia. We're working with host nation forces, building partnerships, and working in concert with shared objectives. And that's what we're trying to get to. Because we abandoned this part of the world for 10 years, we're still in catch up. And, um, and it came back and uh, we saw the effects of that 9-11. So we are gonna be engaged in this part of the world uh, for the rest of our lifetimes. Okay. Uh, because I'm incredibly absent-minded, I'm gonna pretend that I've forgotten all the questions and <laughs> answer the withdrawal question again. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, the, I, I, because I do think it's the fundamental question and this is what this is about. So, so just very quickly to answer that. I think what the president has gained in leverage over the Karzai government and in leverage over his own generals, he has lost in leverage over the Taliban. So the second half of the speech is all about how he is looking at Afghanistan in the context of other issues. He talks about financial cost. He talks about having to think about Somalia and Yemen. He conjures the specter of Eisenhower sitting at his desk weighing different priorities. All of this is very useful because it's an argument for a more minimal engagement, even ultimately possibly an argument for withdrawal because it's an argument that says to the Karzai government, look, you are not the be all and end all, failure is an option, we're not gonna write a blank check to you, and, and in the same direction to the generals. It provides the argument for why he's not gonna send more troops. But the problem with the whole thing 
is that withdrawal is fatal optically in terms of dealing with the Taliban, not because of questions of how you can outfight them, but because the only reason they are ever going to want to negotiate is if they are brought to acknowledge that they're not going to win, if they're brought to acknowledge that there is some kind of permanent presence there with which they have to deal. And I'm afraid by giving that away, we've given away our major political bargaining chip. Over the mic. I really wanted to answer the timeline question as well. <laughs> Mostly because I think it uh, depends on um, it depends on this theory that if you make people insecure, you will inspire them to do harder work. And I think that's a fundamentally questionable assumption. Um, but let me say a word or two uh, to Deborah's point and to Sykes' point. Um, Deborah's point was, why do we have to be simplistic? And I would say that we certainly don't want the people who are executing the strategy or who are devising the strategy to have a simplistic view of what is going on. These are, as you pointed out, very, very sophisticated, uh, complicated situations. However, there is a real premium on communication. And as I mentioned before, communication across a whole range of audiences. And, the, and there's a huge opportunity for miscommunication, misunderstanding. So I think there is a, a value to a simplicity of a message. Um, even though I don't think that has to mean that we think simply about the challenge. Um, to Sykes' point about um, learning from the past, I would agree entirely that we need to learn from the past. I would begin just by saying that 2001 Afghanistan is a very different situation than in 2009. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on that, but the, the threat level is different. Certainly the perception of American power is different. Uh, the regional situation is different. But you know, just three things off the top of my head, things that we should learn um, and apply in Afghanistan today from our past eight years in Afghanistan, you know, one, it takes a long time to build capacity. You know, the thing that I'm fearful of is that we will be holding Afghans accountable for things that they don't have the capability to do. And we have to be careful that we don't mistake the lack of capability for the lack of desire or intention. Secondly, from the 1990s, I think we just have to be careful about decentralization. Obviously, working just through Kabul is not the solution. We need to work through uh, decentralized uh, uh, capacities. But we also need to see that there's some connection between what happens in regions um, and, and districts with, with the central government. At the end of the day, we don't want to build up something that looks a lot like the warlord situation in the 90s. And then thirdly and lastly, I would just say um, there, there are lessons about reconciliation that we can look to in the last eight years, that there is a role for reconciliation um, as part of improving the situation in Afghanistan. Um, I would argue on that point, though, reconciliation from a position of strength is, um, is one that's much more likely to be sustainable than reconciliation um, as a substitute for strength. Well, a terrific uh, uh, review. I think the Afghans have a saying. They say, uh, you know, you have a watch, but we have the time. Uh, but in any case, tonight, uh, our time has run out. So for a panel that uh, includes the military, civilian policymakers, and a leader of an NGO, and a very lively discussion and terrific questions, let's say thank you very much. <laughs>